present because although Ernesto <laughs> left us on May 11th of 1991, we still feel that he is with us and that he will always be with us. There are some of you who have come because you have heard of him and of the great work that he did and we give a special welcome to you and we thank you for your interest in learning about Ernesto and the work that he did. I'm a, a cousin of Ernesto and uh, there are several members of his family here today and I would like to say that on behalf of Ernesto's family we'd like to thank the Fresno Poets Association for this uh, wonderful event that they are holding in his memory. I'd like to uh, briefly introduce those closest members of his family. There's too many of us to introduce at this time, but I would like to uh, state that his mother, Carmen Trejo, and his father, Luciano Trejo, are present, as is his wife, Diane, his children, Victor, and daughter, Carrie. His brothers, Jose Luis and Rafael, are present. There are several cousins and uncles that are here also. I won't bother to name each one of us. There. I, I wish I could say something to let you know about the wonderful person that Ernesto was. Uh, he lived 41 years of age, and in those 41 years, he led a life full of adventure and excitement, and he really lived life to its fullness. It was very sad to see him leave, but I know that wherever he is, he knows that we remember him and that we love him and that the love we have for him will continue. We'll have a reading of his works and some works that have been written in his memory by his friends, who are the poets that we'll be reading today. And on behalf of the Fresno Poets Association, I would also like to invite you to immediately after the, the reading to remain for a reception that will be held in the lobby area. We'd like to thank uh, the music that was provided by Ruben Delgado, the guitarist. We'll begin with the bilingual reading by Juan Felipe Herrera and John Weinberg, and we'll continue as the program delineates. Muy buenas noches. Uh, me llamo Juan Felipe Herrera y es una honra estar aquí leyendo los poemas de Ernesto Trejo. Good evening, my name is Juan Felipe Herrera and I am very honored to read the work of Ernesto Trejo who I've known and I've met back in 1978 in Mexico, who was the one to send me a note on a poem that I had written before I had known him. Este poema se titula Agosto. Cuando la hermana de tu madre despertó y alabó el día con su único ojo, cuando todas las palomas de la cuadra rogaron en su fiebre, cuando las puntas de sus pies se curvaron al día siguiente y su lámpara guiñó, Ahí estabas tú. Te viste en el espejo y supiste que estabas solo. Era agosto. Un año después regresó el terror cuando viste 
a tu único amigo muerto bajo la lluvia, sus botas vaqueras llenas de un fango también muerto. En el espejo supiste que estaba solo, mentiste a tu bicicleta, el patio donde jugabas sería de agua, allí los huevecillos podrían contener ballenas, caballos alados, bomberos que en sus trajes brillosos arderían como hormigas. Aburrido, regresaste a casa y arrancaste las plumas de tu boina. Una a una les diste nombres propios y les ordenaste que cantaran hacia el espacio que en otro tiempo se llenó con un diente tuyo. August. When the sister of your mother woke up and blessed the day with her one eye, when all the pigeons in the block prayed in her fever, when her toes curled the next day and her lamp winked, you were there, a child. You took yourself by the hand through everything. This was August, and a year later, it all came back, the terror. When you saw your one friend in the rain, the mud on his cowboy boots also dead. You took yourself by the hand. You lied to your bicycle. The lawn on which you played was water. There, the eggs could hold whales, winged horses, firemen in shiny suits that might burn like ants. Bored, you went into the house and pulled the feathers from your hat one by one, gave them each a name and commanded them to sing into the space that once held one of your teeth. Este poema se titula Al niño muerto en mi laringe. Es un poema especial para mí porque este fue el poema que me mandó a, a mí Ernesto en 1977, cuando yo publicaba una publicación en San Diego, California. Y lo publicamos, publicamos este poema. Al niño muerto en mi laringe. Special poem for me because this is the poem that Ernesto sent me back in 1976 for publication, I was doing a small broadside in San Diego, California, and I was very happy and very pleased to publish it. And now, I am standing here reading this poem. Desde muy temprano me encuentro en un entierro. A este niño lo vestí de ángel y le desprendí el nombre, lo maldije, y le quité a sus padres. Le dije que se fuera para siempre, que estoy aquí. Desde sus hombros yo me deslizaba como aceite. Sus ojos sobre mí eran un zoológico. ¿Y qué compartimos? Le debo la vida y lo enterré con tierra fresca y un escupitajo. Siempre está disparando anillos de humo, promesas que flotan al cielo. Yo soy una tundra por donde vaga, llevando un pedazo de carne bajo el brazo. ¿Me dejará introducirme como la luz entre sus párpados? ¿Será un cuento que alimente mis grandes huesos? ¿Vendrá de vez en cuando a enseñarme la pelusa en sus bolsillos? To 
to the child dead in my larynx. Since morning, I've been at a burial. I dressed this boy like an angel and took away his name, cussed him and snatched away his parents, kicked him in the ass to prove that I'm here. I would spill off his shoulders like grease. He would be a zoo staring me down. And what do we share? He gave birth to me. I buried him with fresh dirt and spit. He's always shooting rings of smoke, promises floating to heaven. I'm a tundra where he wanders, carrying flesh under his arm. Would he let me break in the light through his eyelids? Would he be a story to feed my big bones? Would he come around to show me the lint inside his pockets? Este poema se titula El Día de los Vendedores Ambulantes, dedicado a Philip Levine. Antes del alba te llamé, poema, pero no acudiste. Me había despertado el canto del cardenal sobre la cerca. No estabas en mi escritorio, en todas las palabras que escribí y aventé al cesto. No estabas en mis zapatos, en las cartas que fueron y vinieron todo el mes, ni en el espacio sostenido por la ventana, los catorce árboles, las siete estrellas siempre rezagadas. Así que salí como un borracho, oriné por largo tiempo en la zanja y observé la ascensión lenta del vapor. Pronto el día de los vendedores ambulantes estaría aquí. Ven, vendrían pregonando a voz de trompetas suelas para los zapatos, escudriñando en busca de cuchillos sin filo anunciando continentes de manzanas y la fe que arde en los radios viejos. Dos caballos cansados jalarían, una carreta testada de legumbres con hormigas escondidas bajo las cebollas. Quizá tú también llegarías entonces, habiendo despertado al canto de un pájaro que conocí por nombre, no me dije nada, y con la araña, la abeja entumecida y el gato reflejado sobre el agua, me incliné. The Day of Vendors for Philip Levine. Before dawn, I called for you my poem, but you didn't come. I had woken up to the song of the cardinal perched on the fence. You weren't at my desk and all the words that I wrote down and crossed out. You weren't in my shoes, nor in the letters that had come and gone all month, nor in the space held by my window, its 14 trees, its seven stars that always lag behind. All the roads of my eyes would have plunged my brain or stumbled out like light to look for you. So I stepped out like a drunk and pissed long and yellow in the ditch and watched the steam rise slowly. Soon, the day of vendors would begin. They would come trumpeting new leather soles, searching out dull knives, announcing continents of apples and the faith that burns in old radios. Vegetable carts with ants hiding under full crates and tired horses leading them would come. Maybe you too would come, having woken up to the song of a bird whose name I knew. 
I said nothing to myself. And with the spider, the numb bee, the cat mirrored in water, I bowed. Este poema se titula Es tu nombre y es también diciembre. Es tu nombre y es también diciembre. Se disuelven las últimas luces del pueblo. Mi boca asciende como el eco de dos campanas y se detiene frente a tu corazón. Observo cómo te quedas dormida. Eres no la cazadora, sino el siervo. Eres un manojo de flores en una terraza que contempla el invierno. En otras ciudades los hombres se levantan, en otros sueños ciudades se hierguen sin nombre. Un arroyo se bifurca ante tus dedos, o la procesión del viento en tus dedos se detiene. Es el espacio entre los peldaños, la marcha tranquila del sol en emboscada. ¿Qué piel no está desnuda? ¿Qué puño no golpea sobre un muro? Es la nieve que sopla en todos los jardines, entrando a saco donde quiere. It's your name, and it's also December. It's your name and it's also December. The last lights of the town blank out like the pulse that climbs two churches and stops. I watch you fall asleep and find you not the hunter but the deer. Find you a patch of flowers on a terrace facing the white sea. Winter without end. In other cities men rise. In other dreams cities rise nameless. A brook forks when your fingers part, or else the procession of the wind pauses before your fingers. It's the spaces between stars, the quiet march of the sun lying in ambush. It's the words that stop squealing, what skin isn't bare, what fist doesn't pound on a wall. It's the snow blowing through every garden, entering every house. Para terminar este, este, esta lectura de principio, sigue el poema titulado Nubes. Al alba las nubes son duraznos, sobre los árboles desnudos. De día se comportan como corderos perdidos o se acercan a nosotros como ofrendas. De noche reflejan algo parecido a un humo en el corazón y confunden una pistola con un ojo. Más tarde, agotadas, descansan esperando la hora de abrirse como párpados. Clouds. At dawn, there are huge peaches on the bare trees, 
All day they act like the lost, or else they approach us asking. At night, they reflect something like smoke in the heart that confuses a pistol for an eye. Later, exhausted, they rest like us, waiting for the moment of parting, like eyelids. I would like to uh, read a translation of the poet, the Mexican poet and dramatist, Xavier Verrutia. The translator, you probably don't recognize, his name is Martin Alejo. One day over coffee, Ernesto, who's an exquisite translator, gave Omar Salinas and I the idea to translate a poem. As it turned out, I didn't do anything. But Omar and Ernesto translated the poem Nocturne in which death speaks. Martin Alejo is a combination of the fictitious name we gave the translator. The last name is actually a, it's a combination of Omar's name and Ernesto's name. We took, this is how the poetic mind works, it is, it is sometimes with reason. Um, we took, well, first of all, neither one of them wanted uh, to put their name on the translation because they, they had a part in both. We didn't want to, for instance, call it the author's last name, Salejo. I don't know, that just didn't sound right. And then Salejo it was, was a little bit silly, we thought. So we took Omar, the first syllable of Omar's last name. We took the last syllable of Ernesto's last name. We got rid of all the hard consonants. We wanted to bring the two together so, and we, so we wanted to use the Spanish and, which is E. That wasn't good enough, so we anglicized it. We softened the vowel, and we came up with Alejo, which also rhymes with Trejo, which also rhymes with Vallejo, the great Peruvian poet who we so passionately admired. Now, Martin, well, since I, I can only guess at this. I can also use my imagination. This all took place in a coffee shop. So someone probably yelled for the busboy, hey Martin, we clean up table number four, and it just clicked, Martin Alejo, what a beautiful name. <laughs> so I would like to read this poem in English, and Omar Salinas, the co-translator, will, will follow me and, and recite it in Spanish. Nocturne in which death speaks. If death had come here with me to New Haven, hidden in an empty space beside my clothes, in my suitcase, in the pocket of one of my suits, between the pages of a book like the signal that fails to remind me of anything, if my own particular death were waiting for a date, an instant, that only she knows to tell me, I'm here. I followed you like the shadow that is not possible to leave hastily at home, like a small pocket of warm and invisible air mixed with the hard and cold air you breathe, like the memory you want most, like forgetfulness, yes, the forgetfulness that you've let fall over things you now wish not to remember, and it is futile to move your head in search of me. I am here close and you can't see me. I am outside of you and a while inside. The sea is nothing which like a god you wish to put between us. The ground which men measure and which they kill and get killed is meaningless. Nor the dream that you, in which you would believe to live without me, where I myself draw and erase it, 
nor the days you count one time and again at all hours, nor the hours you kill with pride without thinking they are reborn outside you. These things are nothing, nor the numerous traps you set for me, nor the childish screws with which you have wanted to leave me fooled, forgotten. I am here. Don't you feel me? Open your eyes. Close them if you feel like it. I ask myself, if no one entered the room, who cautiously shut the door? What strange force of gravity caused the piece of paper on the table to fall? Why does the voice of a woman talking on the street makes herself known here without an invitation? And when I press my pen to the paper, something like my blood reds and runs in her, and I feel the uneven letters I write now are smaller, weaker, and no longer belong to my hand. O Marcellinus. Buenas noches. Good evening. <clears throat> the poem that John just read uh, translates as, uh, or rather in the original Spanish, uh, Nocturno en que habla la muerte. This is ironic. Uh, we were working on death poems, and it was uh, about a year before his death, and uh, so we thought it'd be appropriate anyway. Okay, Nocturno en que habla la muerte. Si la muerte hubiera venido aquí a New Haven, escondida en un hueco de mi ropa en la maleta, en el bolsillo de uno de mis trajes, entre las páginas de un libro, como la señal que ya no me recuerda nada, si mi muerte particular estuviera esperando una fecha, un instante que solo ella conoce para decirme, aquí estoy, te he seguido como la, som la sombra, que no es posible dejar así nomás en casa, como un poco de aire cálido y e invisible, mezclado el aire duro y frío que respiras, como el recuerdo de, la, de lo que más quieres, como el olvido, sí, como el olvido que has dejado caer sobre las cosas que, nos, que no quisieras recordar ahora. Y es inútil que vuelvas la cabeza en mi busca, estoy tan cerca que no me puedes verme, Estoy fuera de ti y a un tiempo dentro. Nada es el mar que como un Dios quisiste poner entre los dos. Nada es la tierra que los hombres miden y por lo que matan y mueren. Ni el sueño en que quisieras creer que vives sin mí cuando yo mismo lo dibujo y lo borro. Ni los días que cuentas una vez y otra vez a todas horas. Ni las horas que matas con orgullo, sin pensar que renacen fuera de ti. Nada son estas cosas, ni los innumerables lazos que me entendiste, ni las infantiles argucias con que has querido dejarme engañada, olvidada. Aquí estoy, no me sientes. Abre los ojos, ciérralos, si quieres. Y me pregunta ahora, Si nadie entre en la pieza contigua, ¿quién cerró cautelosamente la puerta? ¿Qué misteriosa fuerza de gravedad hizo caer la hoja de papel que, estoy en la, que estaba en la mesa? ¿Por qué se instala aquí de pronto y sin que yo lo, la invite la voz de una mujer que habla en la calle? Y al oprimir la pluma, algo como la sangre late y circula en ella, y siente que las letras desiguales que escribo ahora, más pequeñas, más trémulas, más débiles, ya no son de mi mano solamente. Mi nombre es Omar Salinas, y voy a leer un poema. Voy a leer un poema de que, de que yo escribí para Ernesto. It's in English, poem for Ernesto Trejo in memory.
gone to that place where your dreams did not carry you. My friend, we are sad as the stray dogs of winter without you. Cheerful troubadour, death forlorn, death detested, too soon taken, too soon lost to this world. Yet your voice rises to the mountains, still poetic there among the sequoias, and the young evening stars stop to listen, bemused by your conversations. With the exuberance, the courage of the bullfighter, you took your place and fought. Finally, a night came down, a black cape, a sweeping Veronica, and you were gone. I direct my voice to the dust still hovering somewhere above the arena. Good night now, sweet amigo. Last poem is uh, by Ernesto, page 69 in his book. Today I, I I'll sit still. It's a wonderful poem. It's uh, very playful with words. As, as we know Ernesto, Ernesto was a cheerful man, happy man. And this is, uh, today I'll sit still. Today I'll sit still. When my dog shuffles over and offers me his freeze in his hole, I'll turn away. To everything I close my eyes, slice the darkness and eat it. I'll refuse to give money on a platter or a wet case under the moon. Today I'll just sit and say no to everyone and everything. To the book on my desk, its sad tale of abandonment, remorse, and death, I'll keep it on the tip of my tongue like a lukewarm dime. No to the Daily Mail with its greasy fingers. No to the telephone and its humming through the carcass of a sparrow. No to every projection of the self. No to me, this preposterous accident who speaks of the self. Today I'll be antisocial. Today I'll grow into myself, be the river of my blood, the sky inside my eyes, the maze of my ribs, the dust that settles on my heart. I let my bones sink like pebbles in a pond. I let my feet grow roots and be an extra zero on the checks that I'll refuse to write. <laughs> Thank you. Nerves Trailing is a translation of Jaime Sabinas by Ernesto and Phil Levine. I'm out on this bed with nerves trailing from my body like frayed threads, like the whiskers of an old broom dragging on the floor, tugging at the bundle of my soul. I'm dead tired, more tired of using my heart every day than my legs. I wait at all hours for the landslide, the scheduled collapse that will bury me. You have to shut your eyes as in sleep and hold every leaf of your body still. This can occur from one moment to the next, this stilling oneself. Handkerchiefs of air are slowly being spun. Heavy shadows scrape the walls. Heaven is sucking you up through the roof. Tomorrow you'll rise again and walk among your people. You'll love the sun, the cold, the cars, trains, the fancy shops and stables, the walls to which lovers plaster themselves like posters at dusk, the empty parks where sorrow walks head down and your dreams slump on a bench, where the lover slides his hand under a skirt as the ambulance whistles a new shift into the factories of death. You'll love the magic city and in her the land you dream, the blazing streets burned by all those who love them, the open doors of bars, the surprises of the bookshops, the flower stands, the barefoot kids who don't want to be the noble poor, the movie marquees, the ads, the rush of those who have nowhere to go. You'll love the pavement below and the attics above, the drainage pumps and the tow trucks, the palaces and the first class hotels, and the watchdogs in the yards of those houses where two or three are going to die. You'll love the smell of donuts that signal the poor all night like a beacon, 
and your head will be turned by some woman's perfume left in the air like a floating boa. You'll love the amusement parks where the poor get dizzy and laugh, the zoo where we all feel superior, the hospitals where pain makes more brothers than poverty, the orphanages and nurseries where the kids play, all those places where tenderness nudges forth like a sprout, and all things lead you to give thanks. Run your hand over the surfaces of furniture. Wipe away the dust that has fallen on your mirror. Everywhere there are seeds that want to bear. Life bursts from you like scarlet fever without warning. And then the title poem of Ernesto's last book, Entering a Life. Once I was in love, and I think I loved that girl much more than she loved me. Would I heal? Would I appear once in her dreams robed in yellow light as an omen of truth? In the frailty of love, I resented her. Had she equaled the intensity of my longing, I could have imagined our bodies as one single lovely beast roaming. And if this beast died the next day, its death would not matter. I remember that when I was 12, I heard about an uncle who 20 years before had gone away for good. But he didn't die like his younger brother, whose life was taken slowly by TB. My uncle, who disappeared, simply stopped writing home, stopped sending money and postcards from exotic places, Los Angeles, Pittsburgh, Des Moines. They wondered where you went, Uncle Felix. The story about you entered my life, a distant airplane that got closer until it really meant nothing between two people talking. They just talk louder, and as the plane disappears in the sky, their voices subside. No one looks up. You, Felix, the extrovert, the handsome one, the dancer, the one who talked to children, dazzled the girls and had the quiet respect of men, could have saved them. This I could tell in their envy and admiration and their quiet resentment that grew like fingernails. You could have linked them to the world and to each other, and for that their lives could have been different. Instead, they sought spirits and became thieves, liars, converts to anything, whorehouse keepers, solid citizens. Had you died for real, they could have gone on and someone would have said in hushed tones at family gatherings, Felix, poor soul, he died so young. They could have taken turns at this. Instead, you entered their lives for a short time, a companion at the movies who leaves his seat and never returns while they all sit there waiting until the theater closes and they are ushered out. Two years after your letters stopped, someone saw you in Missouri tending desk at a motel on the outskirts of a town with an unpronounceable name. I pictured you behind the counter, not really noticed by the young man who fills out the register, the bulge on his pants breathing with a life of its own. When the young man and his girl walk up to their room, their laughter stays in the air for a few seconds and then enters slowly the worn rug. You turn around and continue reading a book, your back bent like the tall grass across the highway or like your life. Later, someone said you were doing time in El Paso for smuggling workers. You appeared then defiant in a quiet way, a little fortune stashed away for your release, keeping to yourself. Years later, someone swore you were in Chicago, portly and happy, the owner of a jewelry store. I said to myself, why not? You could wear thick glasses and a three-piece suit, speak in low tones and seldom smile, for it would be a quiet business, the thick carpet drowning out your steps. Another time it was you in the hospital in San Jose, a broken back, another casualty of the apricot season. 
I imagined you craving morphine while the young nurses gathered in the next room for coffee and talked of boyfriends going off to war, of diseases entering their children, of boredom eating up their youth. These stories went on for years, even after your parents died and your brothers and sisters were scattered around like bruised fruit. Uncle, after 20 years of stories, I know so little. I want to imagine you content, honoring your name. I want you falling in love once with a girl whose love matched the intensity of yours. I see you boisterous and the two of you drunk with love for a few years, until one day she runs off with a lover and leaves you with two daughters whom you raise. Years pass and you are left a little less happy and unsure of everything and ashamed at being shortchanged. Or maybe you felt belittled and didn't care and changed your name and invented a past to tell your daughters, just as I am inventing your life now, because I no longer want to hear stories or obituaries about you. I don't want you to be a ghost, disturbing lives that had nothing to do with yours, even if at one time they called you brother. Son. I've written a poem in Ernesto's memory entitled White Field. After your death, I think black rose, but right, white field, the way you would, a light in your eyes. The field near my house, feathery with wild oats and blowing in May. I write, field under full moon, dry like a cough or hair bleached and falling, what you left us plow's blade cutting in and the air filled with dust. It's rootedness that lies exposed and flies. It's old Mother Earth, her suck and murmurings lifted with a groan and given up. Not the elegance I try to shape from her rough roots. It's these shifting, blowing lines, you in the air I breathe. and Ernesto's poem entitled, You. This morning, for no reason at all, I thought of you. There's no mystery here. You've been a tiny lump in my throat all these years, making house in the dark. I imagine you in your other house, posted behind the kitchen window, waiting for your children to step off the bus and come to you hungry. A minute ago, you stumbled in and out of rooms, looking for a way out. But it was raining outside, and you too were hungry. This is a poem that Ernesto liked a lot. We talked about it a few times. It's by the Mexican poet Javier Villarusha in translation by Donald Justice, Cemetery in the Snow. Nothing is like a cemetery in the snow. What name is there for the whiteness upon the white? The sky has let down insensible stones of snow upon the tombs and all that is left now is snow upon snow, like a hand settled on itself forever. Birds prefer to cut through the sky, to wound the invisible corridors of the air, so as to leave the snow alone, which is to leave it intact, which is to leave it snow. Because it is not enough to say that a cemetery in the snow is like a sleep without dreams, or like a few blank eyes, though it is something like an insensible and sleeping body, like one silence fallen upon another, 
and like the white persistence of oblivion. Nothing is like a cemetery in the snow because the snow is above all silent, more silent still upon bloodless slabs, lips that can no longer say a word. This is the poem that Roberta Spear wrote following Ernesto's death. Its title is The Mutiny of Angels. Had you awakened later as the full flush of light lifted the flowers from the pale stitches of your quilt, had you felt the strength of a good night's sleep, you might have fought them off. But on that 23rd day of wind, you turned in your last dream to face the silver branches slashing the empty spaces the sky would fill. The mutiny of angels had begun and no one could stop it. For weeks, their number had grown in the grubby corners of this city until the scorched lilacs thrashing the fences teemed with celestial cousins. And with no respect for your need to return gracefully to the earth, to that new day after a night of frightful journeys, they took to the alley in robes, hopelessly patched and bleached like the first renegade rays. They banged on lids and peeked into the bedroom where your wife was just stretching and rubbing her half-opened eyes. And from each soft sputter, each hard-earned breath of the man beside her, more angels were released into the air. Throughout the days, they made circles around us like streams of small foreign cars. They scraped and shoved like the crows who had stolen the most majestic branches in the sycamores. They followed the rows of ants up the trunks of orange trees into the fragrance that drifted out like a voice carried by the wind. At dusk, on that 23rd day of wind, the sky was finally still and the dust that settled on leaves and porches also clung to the tender sills of our eyes. We were unable to tell if our tears were from wonder or pain. The angels had taken what they wanted and left. They had taken you. I stood at the sink, tamped out wings of garlic, and slid into the skillet, and watched them flutter as they slid into the skillet. Let these be the last two angels to touch your tongue, the bitter clove and the white star of the orange, one for the beauty of the tears and one for the fire we must fly into and dance with. This poem is Ernesto's and it's titled Because because I spilled the coins from my mouth and called it quits before, you may think of me as a fraud, a fanatic enemy of horoscopes. Dark and frightens me, but friend, it's nothing like the light, which can pierce through taking it all. You can read this, my fear, my awe, the fall from light into flame, my own ignorance finding a path with words and theology. My life is the river Arno approaching the sea. Am I like the wind that bends the wheat fields into submission? Or am I the stalk of wheat carving a small place in the air? I'm going to read the, the president is up before the fruit vendor. The 
president is up before the fruit vendor. He goes to bed after the bus driver. He says history is unfair. If the president has a toothache, we grieve. If he smiles, we smile. Sometimes I think we like him and we sleep happy for it. But once we're asleep, it's different. He worries, he makes laws about our dreams. We may not dream in other languages. We may not dream about a life without him. We may not dream if he's out of the country, but there are ways. We dream while we work and while we eat. When we smile at him and shake his hand, we're dreaming. Sometimes we see his picture and dream of his glasses streaked with blood, his chin tunneled by worms. Around the mouth that punishes and forgives, a string of flies silences what could be the last word. Below his chest, below his chest is covered with the spit of children. Since we have never seen his eyes, we don't dream about them. They are windows that send black light into our hearts. There's another one called E is Love. What fire grows under her skirt? What sparrow is gnawing at his heart? The April air slapping him all the way home. The stupid trees running after the stupid palm, circling his heart. The stars are dust on the table. His dry throat is asking, go on, stupid heart. Go on loving her. Everything you do speaks like a mouth, though you have nothing to say. You wake up to words, table, lipstick balcony hanging like a tongue, flower pot, objects, humble like your heart. It's the world that shouts her name. The moon, tedium under his pillow, the night sprouting like a fountain, his car, a matchbook holding its breath, people, dry sticks poking through water, the streets, question marks pointing nowhere. His body, his living body, his blood like ink and a pulley going crazy. I'm going to take a chance and read a poem I just finished. I hope I don't offend anybody, but uh, I have a few things to say. Uh, And so I think if Ernesto was, would want me to read this, even though maybe it's not done yet. And it's in five, six sections. Like a wild young stallion, you leaped the fence and came to the pastures of poetry and were with us in the velocities of the afternoon mingling in the winds of direction. Your gestures, even your staring away, seem to, br seem to bring a distant, passionate light. History came jumbling, scrambling, halting, toward its blind decisions and settlements. The room darkened around your quiet gentleness. Shirts look better on you. People will bore others with your photograph for years. Your family will multiply your darkest misgivings, cheerfully fate on, leaving the purity and trash of their context. Three, neither the liberty of front flags nor the equality of documents, but the fraternity 
of those who would bear witness to their own truths. Coming with conviction to the door of your study, feathers brushing up the wall, you step to the table through the lens of the Quetzal. This is so, this is not so. This, the drum of production. This, history in the sound box of a guitar. Beat the drum, touch the strings. Four, I came by once and didn't recognize an incinerated Yule Brunner flung open the door and frightened my spirit up through limbs into the blue trees of Arthur. Your poor body, your tortured concern. Later you passed by on thorns, slumped forward in an auto, Diane at the wheel. A plaid wool cap over your bald head, smiling deliciously grinning through all your teeth, through the swarm of diminishing adjustments. Why? You and I began over the phone, settling dates, making comparisons, profiled in a bright wall of books, chattering through miles of ecstatic copper. Later, in a forest of your yard, I cut the great poplar down, missing your house by less than an inch. Sweating in the balm of Gilead, you politely sent me away with my saw ringing. Later we followed Levine's fox along the wall, trotting together, wagging the tongues of saliva. Four. How happy I was to see you walking into the chicken pie. I scrambled to get down there on Fridays, sit with the poets, lifting the imagination over shredded wheat and scrambled ham and eggs. The six-foot plastic chickens working over the chartreuse and chrome furniture. People stood their ground, waiting for the rhythm of the day, us musing, Say, over the craft of Shelley Winters, those moist, starry eyes moaning, wanting to, wanting to do it the way you wanted it, wanting to be everything that you wanted her to be, the urge to be precise. In a pirate movie once, she had John Wayne swaggering overboard. Many a man could have spent his days with her in a one-room shack in Pissville. What a bitch. Was it your wife's graciousness? Was it your son leaping from the porch with his chest out? Was it the way your daughter touched the keys of a piano with that same light that brings brilliance close? I've ceased to believe in death, the development of the soul's intelligence, everything that happens to it is more important than time and space and sound and color. I've read too much science fiction. I have inklings. My father reincarnated into Oregon. I could almost see him bawling in a crib under the pines. Ah. I inkled my mother into the 13th cone of the spirit world to play bridge, unraveling the emotional tangle. Some think me immature. I inkled you back into the future. My religion grazes and kangaroos through the categories of the insane. Bon voyage, pal.
poem I wrote for Ernesto is called E is in Heaven, for Ernesto. E is in heaven, dancing with the moths, dreaming again while fully awake of a wide yard faintly familiar. A small white worm asleep in the heart of an unfolding rose where footprints circle and pause. The romantic anarchist in perpetual love, the overdrawn economist, mapping a fortune in tomorrow's dust. The starry-eyed arsonist has paused here for one last snapshot, his elegant, ordinary hands posed on the hoe. In heaven, white dust carries the music of memory, rain falling, faint breath of a song. E is sitting still, refusing to enter or escape refusing to bow or applaud, wanting to hold what keeps slipping away. The light, the sparrows, speckled shadows flapping from the sycamore where he would perch a while longer on the heavy limbs and comfort us with the simple purity of his flight. And the poem of Ernesto's I chose to read is At My Window. At my window, I write, three children in the swings, testing how high they can go, how much the chains will hold. I imagine this April air humming in their throats, the trees behind them disappearing like ice. Off to one side, a younger kid awaits his turn and pats the ground while his mouth opens in a cry or a yawn. Today, I feel like that kid. Last night I opened my arms to embrace my muted dreams, and when I awoke, I went around, shutting every door and window. Nothing will happen. The sky will go circling above. The trees will dig deeper. In this corner of the planet, with an angle of sunlight on my shoulder, my pencil tucked away, I stand and leave. I would like to read a poem that Philip Levine sent us for this occasion, written in Ernesto's memory. It's called Yanto. Plum, almond, cherry have come and gone. The wisteria has vanished in the dawn. The blackened roses rusting along the barbed wire fence explain how April passed so quickly into this hard wind that waited in the west. Ahead is summer, and the full sun riding at ease above the stun stunned town, no longer yours. Brother, you are gone. That which was earth gone back to earth, that which was human scattered like rain into the darkened wild eyes of herbs that see it all into the valley oak that will not sing, that will not even talk. I would like to read a poem that I wrote in his honor. It's called The Rain's Burden. Tell me, dear friend, where can I reach you now when I rise each morning craving light? to go watch the last shirt tail of stars pale above the rooftops. The trash cans are piled, and the dogs persist in snoring much too safely. The fortune teller lady wakes up in a sweat, shuffles to her wardrobe, cracking her knuckles. And that blue loop of clouds we once laughed at is the only bed I have left to dream on with my eyes wide open. Yesterday, I drew your face among them, between the lion's mane and the dove's eye, and bargained off each part of my body if you would come back and sit beside me until I, too, became bodiless. And what was it you were trying to tell me 
when I watched lightning have the eucalyptus tree, saw the wind carry off its roots and summon the rain to fill in the empty crater. From the chicken pie shop window, I thought I saw you standing beneath the arc of the lone pistachio leaf as it tumbled gracefully to the sidewalk. It was when the air smelled of cinnamon and burnt potatoes. It was when that old couple finally zigzagged the traffic across Olive Avenue, bent over as if they were carrying all their summers on their backs, and the hot pavement had already hardened the feet of your children. It was when those old men filed into their familiar booths and exchanged clues of autumn and when that woman who reads romance novels before coffee was a little late for work, I thought how unfair it is that you can watch me growing thinner and clawing at myself from the inside out while I go looking for signs of you only dreams can send. For nine days I circled your house. The marigolds writhed in the sun. The field mice perished in shadow. The grass yellowed and time smoldered. And when you did not come out, I knew the first rain would have to fall in pellets to soften this chalked over valley and death would quit measuring us. Then I'll go bare my feet to the gutter, watch the rain lap the ruts, water my blood, shrink the clouds, so I'll once again hear your voice, clean as a harp, in the hiss of the palm frond, in the riffle of the sparrow's feather, in the roused eyes of children at play, in the words that rise out of a sunset of leaves, glistening just beyond the tree line. I would like to conclude this reading with the um, poem of Ernesto's. The Death of Sparrows. Lately, I've been watching them, pecking furiously at the ground, then retreating into the eucalyptus where they stagger like compasses before their tiny hearts quit and they drop stone-like. Sometimes my cat will sniff them and jerk back as if pierced on the nose by a needle. In the dark, they go on dying. While burying them, I have shoveled newspapers. Their bloody lips decayed, a child's lucky penny, rusted pipes that go nowhere, the roots of weeds tangled like kite strings or hearts. Tonight, as if for the last time, I hold my woman's face my soul's redoubt. Were I to die, my eyes' vaults exhausted would crave light. Place a dying sparrow in my hands. My soul will find a tree to perch on. Thank you all for joining us in celebrating the poetry, the life, and spirit of our good friend Ernesto Trejo. Arte Americas has a reception for all of us out in the middle of the gallery there, so I hope you'll all join us um, and welcome uh, Ernesto's family who is here. Thank you.